Hello, it's lovely to see you all. Uh, especially lovely to see you if I don't know you. Welcome from me. My name is Ed and I'm uh, the associate leader here at HBC. And uh, I'm going to be opening up the scriptures to us this afternoon and hopefully encourage you. Hopefully you'll be challenged a little bit as well this afternoon. I'm already challenged by what Sam just shared and also what Hugo was bringing earlier. And I love how just stuff just fits together really nicely. So thank you, Holy Spirit, for that. Uh, if you've got a Bible or a phone and you want to follow along with me, then open it up, turn it on, click on your app, whatever. Luke chapter 24. This is a famous story in the New Testament. Uh, this is after Jesus has been crucified and then risen from the dead. And we're going to start in verse 13. So Acts, no, Luke, Acts. Acts is good too. That's like part two of Luke's gospel. Uh, but this one's in Luke. Luke chapter 24, verse 13. Also, hello to you guys on the live stream as well. We love you. Thank you for tuning in. Right, this is what it says. Now, that same day, two of them, this is disciples, two of the followers of Jesus, were going to a village called Emmaus, about seven miles for Jerusalem, from Jerusalem. They were talking with each other about everything that, they had, that had happened. As they talked and discussed these things with each other, Jesus himself came up and walked along with them. But they were kept from recognizing him. He asked them, what are you discussing together as you walk along? They stood still, their faces downcast. One of them, named Cleopas, asked him, are you the only one visiting Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in, the last, in these days? What things, he asked. About Jesus of Nazareth, they replied. He was a prophet, powerful in word and deed before God and all the people. The chief priests and our rulers handed him over to be sentenced to death and they crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one who was going to redeem Israel. And what is more, it is the third day since all this took place. In addition, some of our women amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning, but they didn't find his body. They came and told us that they had seen a vision of angels who had said he was alive. And then some of our companions went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said. But they did not see Jesus. He said to them, how foolish you are. And how slow to believe all that the prophets have spoken. Did not the Messiah have to suffer these things and then enter his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he explained to them what was said in all the scriptures concerning himself. As they approached the village to which they were going, Jesus continued on as if he were going further. But they urged him strongly, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at the table with them, he took bread, he gave thanks, he broke it, and he gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, and they recognized him. And he disappeared out of their sight. They asked each other, were not our hearts burning within us while he talked with us on the road and opened the scriptures to us? They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, it is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then, then the two told them what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Let me pray and then we'll get stuck in. So Jesus, we thank you for this reading of your word. God, would we, as we meet together today, be encouraged by it and be challenged by it. Speak to our hearts this afternoon. Amen. During lockdown, the first one, lockdown, the original, the old school, I decided that I would take a bank holiday weekend to build a decking in my back garden. I like a bit of DIY. I'm a little bit handy at times. But this was a bit of a job. And uh, it, I thought it would take me a day. And at the end of the first day, I realized it hadn't taken me a day. It was going to take me at least one more day. And then towards the end of that second day, I thought to myself, ah, at least another day, great. So it was at this point where I'd cleared the ground on the second day, I'd cut loads of pallets, I was recycling pallets, I thought I'd be you know, good to the environment and use all these leftover pallets from our building stuff that we'd done in our house. So I was hacking away, sawing away, pulling pallets apart, which is no easy thing, I have to say. Pallets have massive nails in them designed not to come out. 
and I was not equipped with the appropriate pallet wrecking crowbar to do the job. So I was, I was aching because I was, was, I was unfit. I'm still unfit. Shh, don't tell anyone. Uh, I was aching, I was sore, and I remember Lindsay had made me a cup of tea, that's my wife, and um, I, I sat down, it was a hot day as well, it was like blistering sunshine in May. I sat down on our garden chair at the back of the garden, and, I, and honestly, the garden was just covered. It was carnage with wood everywhere, just shrapnel of wood pallets and smashing, and some of it meant and some of it just released in anger. Um, just a mess, and, at, and I sat on this chair in my garden, and I took a sip of my tea, which by now had gone lukewarm because I hadn't drunk it hot, and I just chucked my cup. I went, oh, forget it. I'm not doing this. I quit. I was so mad, honestly. I was mad at myself for even thinking of taking this on, and I wanted to quit. I just, that was it. I just gave up, went in, we had dinner. The next day I woke up and I was like, I can't, I can't quit. <laughs> I can't leave the garden like this and the deck half done. So I finished it. Well, so I finished it. You know, it's one of those jobs where it's never quite finished and I just haven't bothered to finish it. Uh, and actually, it's really unsafe now and it's really, like, eroded and rotted and I need um, to do it properly. Anyway, I wanted to quit. Have you just... I don't know, you don't have to show your hands if you don't want to. Have you ever wanted to quit? Have you ever wanted to quit? Have you ever just wanted to give up? Have you ever wanted to go, sack it? <laughs> Jonathan's hands up, well done, mate. <laughs> yeah. I think it's quite a normal thing, isn't it? It's quite a normal thing that we want to give up. That's why I love this story that we just read. This story is a human story. It's two blokes, two friends, two mates, and they've been following Jesus. We're not quite sure who they are. There's not a huge amount about them in the New Testament. We know that one of them is called Cleopas. We know that they hang around with the 11. That's the apostles, Jesus' like core team. Um, but they are walking away from Jerusalem. They're walking away from the events of the last few days where Jesus, their friend, has been nailed to a cross and killed in the most gruesome way. They are walking downcast, it says in the Bible. They are walking with their heads low. I just imagine their whole posture just and walking. And I imagine it wasn't a quick walk either. It was one of those, you know, those walks. You see school kids doing it every day after school with those massive backpacks on year sevens. It gets to about November when it's dark and wet and they're like this. <laughs> it's like you only live around the corner, dude. Just get home. <laughs> um, I just imagine it being one of those just awful walks where you just want the world to swallow you up and everything to be over. I love that they're walking away and it's, it's like they're pretty much, they're walking away from Jesus. They're walking away from Jesus. They're walking away from all of this stuff that they've been doing, hanging around. They've had enough. They, they didn't, we had hoped. Has anyone ever had hope? You had hoped and it didn't work out. This is something that I can just massively identify with. If I'm really honest, these last few years have been, um, for some people, really, really tough. For other people, you've actually done all right over these last couple of years. And then if you're like me, you're just, I'm an emotional roller coaster at the best of times. I'm just up and down, up and down, and, and it's not always been easy. And I've struggled. This last kind of few months, I've really struggled. This last year, really, I've found it quite difficult. And I have to confess, this isn't great, is it, when I'm... Reverend Ed Green, but there have been moments where I've gone, oh, forget it, God. I just want to quit. I want to give it up. Not, not church as such, but just, just everything. Just, I just know. You just get to that point, don't you? Where you're just like, oh, just whatever. I, just, whoosh, whoosh. I haven't even got any words for it. I'm just, whoosh. That's a uh, theological phrase for give up. <laughs> it's all body encompassing. Um, I was sitting with my mates having a, having a breakfast. I have a few church leaders I meet up with, and, uh, and we started joking about, like, what, if you were going to quit, what would you do? <laughs> What's your backup plan? And, uh, and after, you know, we were joking about it, and my backup plan is to, uh, I love sales because I like talking. I'm a talker. I don't know if you noticed that about me. Shut up, Andy. <laughs> and this one, the two Andys that I work with, colleagues of mine, friends for years. <laughs> yeah. Anyway, um, yeah, we were talking, I'd love to do sales, I'd love to do, like, I don't know, estate agent, I don't know, something like that. Property development, I'd quite like to do that as well. Another friend of mine had a similar kind of thing. Anyway, afterwards I was like, actually that's really sad, isn't it? That as, as a leaders, we're kind of talking about these backup plans. 
But it's thoughts that go through our minds. I don't know what you've wanted to quit, whether it's been your faith, like generally, I've given up on, I want to give up on God. I don't even know if there is a God. I come to church and I sing these songs and I just feel like I'm serenading the ceiling because there's just nothing. It gets too hard. The hope that I had just isn't there anymore. And, and oh, I had hoped. And now my hope's gone. And they're walking away from Jesus. And what does Jesus do? He walks with them. He, he walks with them. As they are literally walking away from Jesus, Jesus, the guy that they're walking away from, walks with them. Oh my goodness. The heart of God for people. The heart of God, the love of God for you, for me, for these guys that as they're leaving, downcast, they had hope, their hope's gone, they've given up, they're walking back to Emmaus, it's a seven mile trek, it probably took them hours because they're downcast and they're slow. And what happens? But the guy that they're walking away from, the Messiah, the one who they had hoped in, walks with them. And he says to them, what are you doing? And they tell him, and then I love it. And this is where I feel challenged reading the text. Because he says to them, he said, how foolish you are. And when I read that, I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, I'm foolish. I'm, I'm a little bit foolish at times. And I, th I think we probably all are. We're probably all a bit foolish at times where we think it should have worked out like this and it didn't. And then we're going to go, oh, there's no God. And then God's like, oh, don't be foolish. Don't be foolish. Don't you understand? I love it in Isaiah where it says, don't you understand? Don't you know that this is the God who created the heavens and the earth? He strung out the stars in the sky and he names each one of them. He knows all the names of the sky. How much more then will God know us? And he says, even in Isaiah, it says that young men will stumble and fall, but those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength and they will rise up on wings like eagles. This is what it looks like. When God raises you up on wings like eagles, it's not a dramatic whoosh, up into the sky. That would be awesome. And I've preached before about I'd love it to be helicopter Jesus. You know, when we're in pain and suffering and dark moments, you just want like and just like picks you up, takes you out of the situation. Here's the Bahamas. Enjoy yourself. I'd love, love that. Wouldn't we love that? That would be amazing, wouldn't it? Helicopter Jesus. It, it doesn't work like that. It doesn't work like that. His raging up on wings like eagles looks like walking alongside you on a dusty road when your hope is gone. And you're like that. And then he opens up the scriptures and he starts with Moses and the prophets and he reveals everything that the Old Testament says about him. And they don't know who he is. And they're like, who is this guy? But he's amazing. And, uh, and their hearts are obviously burning. They talk about it later. And then I love when they get to the place where, where they're going. Jesus, like, he fakes that he's going to not stay. He's like, oh, yeah, cool, nice one. See you later, guys. Oh, yeah, see you later. And he kind of fakes it. But all along, he knows that he wants them to invite him in. But there's a choice then, isn't there, for the disciples? There's a choice here. They could have just gone, oh, yeah, see you later. But they didn't. Even though they don't really know who he is, but he's, there's something about this guy. And they say, hey, come in. There's a response from them. Come in, hang out with us. And he breaks the bread and their eyes are opened. And then, whoosh, where's he gone? He just disappears out of, the, out of the room. Like what? And they don't really dwell on that. They just go, it was Jesus. Let's get back to Jerusalem. And they've, lit, they've walked seven miles. It's evening. It's dark. It's meal time. It's dinner time. And they just drop it all and they peg it back to Jerusalem because they need to get back to the other disciples. Man, that's a response, isn't it, to encountering Jesus? Like, oh, what am I doing here? Let's leg it back to where I'm supposed to be. I was, I've been thinking about all of this last year, and I've been thinking about my own heart, my own journey, and I've also been thinking about many of us here in the room or maybe watching online, people who are part of HBC Chester and our church family. And I've been thinking about the global church as well, the national church. And here's one of the things that I'm thinking about. This is what I'm kind of seeing. I'm seeing that it's been difficult. It's been really tough for some people, like I said. Others of us have been okay. Some of us have been really up and down. But let's be honest, it's not been great. It hasn't been great. We haven't been able to do things that we wanted to do. Uh, and perhaps for some of us, we've lost some of our hope along the way. That we hoped that it would be locked down for three months. And then two years later, we're still talking about it, and it's not been great. 
And, uh, and I'm thinking about my own response. Sometimes I'm really like going through it with God and I've been loving it and spending time with him. And other times I found it really hard. And I think one of the things that I really want to think about for me and for us is, um, is for me is to cultivate, to cultivate my faith. To have a faith that's robust and strong. That when disappointment, when struggle, when hurt comes along, that I'm not the emotional roller coaster that I've been throughout my history, that I would be constant in my trust of following Jesus. That's what I want for my own heart. And it, and it improves. I'm not where I was three years ago or you know, 10 years ago, say, or whatever. And I'm, you know, we're moving forward and discipleship is a journey. But I want to cultivate a faith that is robust and is, and is really strong. But here's the thing with Jesus. He's so gentle and so kind. I grew up in a, in a form of Christianity that, that wasn't particularly focused on the gentleness and the grace of God. I went to a few churches when I was growing up. Um, I went to the whole context, but churches like Greater Grace would be in their name. And you can always guarantee that if a church has got something like Greater Grace or the Grace of God, whatever, it's probably the one that's got the least grace in it. I grew up in a, in a kind of Christianity that didn't have a lot of grace in it. And as I've got to know Jesus more and more over the years, I just see how lovely he is. I see how beautiful he is. I see how kind he is. I also see how strong he is. And I also see how harsh he is at times when he's like, you guys are so foolish. And they're like, who's this guy? He's calling us foolish. But he, he convicts us, doesn't he, of our sin. But at the same time, he walks with us in our pain and in our suffering because he is strong and gentle and kind. But he's also this mighty, powerful savior who wants us to live our lives to the full. I've been reading a book called um, The Beautiful Resistance uh, by John Tyson. I think it's called that. Is it called that? Anyone else reading it? It's great. I know, I know you are. Of course you are. Um, and it, in it, it basically makes some observations about our society and our culture. And this is quite helpful to understand because actually the reason why some of us as Christians are so much like we are, well, I don't know what that is. Anyway, um, this is what, he quotes this guy called A.J. Swoboda, who is an awesome guy, writes loads about um, Sabbath and resting and really recommend uh, A.J. Swoboda's book. But anyway, this is John Tyson quoting his book. This is what Swoboda says. He says, Our time-saving devices, technological conveniences, and cheap mobility have seemingly made life much easier and interconnected. As a result, we have more information at our fingertips than anyone in history. Yet with all this progress, we are ominously, om ominously dissatisfied. Our souls increasingly pant for meaning and value and truth as they wither away, exhausted, frazzled, displeased, ever on edge. Our bodies wear ragged, our spirits thirst. He carries on to say, we seem to be able to do anything but quench our true thirst for the life of God. The result is that we have become perhaps the most emotionally exhausted, psychologically overworked, spiritually malnourished people in history. And when I read it, I was like, oh, yeah. As in not, oh yeah, oh yeah. As in like, hmm. That says something there, doesn't it? And then Tyson says that the worries of life and the deceitfulness of wealth choke the word, making it unfruitful. It's talking about the parable of the sower. He says things that overwhelm us and they rob us of intimacy and fruitfulness. They don't manifest themselves as grave spiritual threats. It's not like some massive, obvious, like, you know, a cult coven of witches turns up into your house all of a sudden. It's not like that. It's so much more subtle. He talks about travel sports and weekends rob us of local and religious connection. Season three of Fill in the Blank on Netflix takes away from listening to our neighbours. Relentlessly checking social media, which cultivates, cultivates envy and erodes compassion. These things subtly seduce, seduce us and distort our vision of life. They take up the space required for the gospel to thrive. He carries on, he says so much stuff, uh, but he says, um, it's hard to think about eternity and the kingdom of God when you're gasping for air. It's hard to think about anything but your next breath. It's hard to think about, it's hard to think at all during cultural asphyxiation. Do you feel this pressure under all the activity and demands? Are you aware of the yoke that's around your neck? And as I read all of this, and I'm thinking about preaching on Sunday, it was kind of two separate occasions, planning the sermon, reading this. And I was like, oh, 
that speaks to some of what perhaps I've been feeling and maybe some of us have been feeling, that cultural asphyxiation which just gets in the way of following Jesus. But in amongst it all, like I said, Jesus is really kind and he walks with the disciples. So in my heart, I'm going, oh yeah, Jesus. I want to I wanna get back to that moment where I drop everything and I run back to my Jerusalem of whatever that might be, the purposes that God has for me in my life. I want to be in that place where I can just get up and go. But it comes in that moment of intimacy, doesn't it, with Jesus at the table, the breaking of bread, sitting down to have a meal. There's this beautiful intimacy. And I love that in our worship. We just want to foster that intimacy with God. Do you know, one of the biggest reveals of the heart of God is that Jesus, when he rises from the dead, he's got 40 days, 40 days from when he rose from the dead before he ascends to heaven. And what he doesn't do is he doesn't book a boat. I was going to say a plane. He doesn't book a boat to Rome. He doesn't, he doesn't feel right, right, now I've risen from the dead, boom, Caesar, I'm coming. He doesn't do that. He doesn't go and see the Sadducees or the Pharisees or any other seas. He doesn't, he doesn't go and see them. He doesn't go and go, hey, look, what I told you was real. You can put your hands here if you want. He doesn't do that. Do you know what he does for 40 days? He, he walks on a road with two of his mates who had hoped and whose heads had dropped. He goes and finds Peter fishing. He's like, why are you fishing again? Come over here. I've got some sheep for you to feed. He goes and hangs out with the disciples in the upper room. He spends 40 days appearing to his disciples and gathering them back to himself. And I was thinking about this, and I was thinking, like, what is God saying to us in this season that we're in? That's what I think God's saying to us. That's what I think Jesus is saying to us as HBC, but also perhaps as the global church as well. He's saying, come back to me. Let's gather back. Let's come back. Let's get our hearts in the right place. Let's get ourselves in that right place. Let's come together in the presence of our Lord and Savior. Let's let him shape our lives and remind us of who we are and what we're called to do. I love there's a phrase that says you're not just saved from something, you're saved for something. We all have a plan and a purpose for our life that is God-ordained and God-breathed. And I don't know what it looks like. It looks like a whole bunch of different things for us. But I want to be in that place where I can step into whatever it is that God has for me in my Jerusalem. I want to be able to run back to Jesus and say, yeah, well, run back to, just have that encounter, but just get back to, yes, Jesus. But then once I'm there, I don't want to go through that cycle again of being in that same place and feeling like I need Jesus to come alongside me and walk down the road with me. And if anything, when I look at this story, there's one character that I really want to be, and it's Jesus. Because actually, isn't that the whole point of being a Christian is that we're shaped to be like Jesus? The whole point of being a disciple of Jesus is that we learn to become like Jesus. I want to be the guy that walks down the road with people who are struggling with their faith and say, hey, this is Jesus. I want to be that guy. Oh, I'm, man, time's going. I get carried away, but I like it. Just one last quick thing. And then we're going to worship and we're going to just cry out to Jesus, I think. That's what I want to do anyway. Uh, when I was at Fresh Dreams a couple of weeks ago, I was sat... Uh, I was stood doing the camera, helping out, and I was just asking God. I was like, God, talking to him. And then the story of the feeding of the 5,000 came to mind. And, um, and I felt Jesus say to me, he said, where are you in the story? Like, if you were, in the, if you were there, where, where, who are you? Which character are you in the story? And, you know, we all want to jump to the little boy with the five fish, don't we? And we've heard the sermon preached probably. I've, in fact, I've probably preached the sermon. Just bring whatever you've got to Jesus, and he'll bless it and do amazing things with you. That's a good sermon. That'll preach. It's good. But I was like... Yeah, I don't think I'm that little boy at the moment, Jesus, if I'm really honest. I don't think I'm him. And Jesus is like, well, where are you then? Who are you in the story? I was like, well, the disciples, they could be cool. I was like, oh, I don't feel like I've got the energy to be a disciple, one of those disciples handing out, giving out, serving. He's like, where are you in the story, Ed? I was like, I, th I think I'm probably in the crowd. He's like, where in the crowd? And I'd like to have said I was on the front row, but if I was really honest at that moment, I felt like I was at the back of the crowd. 5,000 men gathered, plus women and children, I don't know, let's say at least 10,000, maybe 15,000 people. And there's Ed at the back. And, and I felt like I'd let God down because I wasn't in the place where I felt like I should be. How many times have we felt that as Christians that, that we're supposed to be in this particular place? And, and in fact, we can convince ourselves that that's where we are. We can try and convince Jesus that's where we are. We say to Jesus, yeah, I'm, I'm good, Jesus, I'm over here. 
And Jesus is like, yeah, but you're not, are you? You're actually over, over here. And then that vulnerable moment of being real with Jesus, feeling like I've, I'm just letting God down because I don't feel like I'm in, a, in the best place. I felt like he just bent down and whispered in my ear. And I felt like he said, at least you turned up. At least you turned up. At least you're here. For us, when you're struggling, when your hope's gone, when you don't know what to do, when you want to quit, keep turning up. Keep turning up. There's power in turning up. It's significant. It's in those moments where you turn up where Jesus might just walk alongside you. He might sit down and break bread with you. And maybe it's one of your friends that walks alongside you, Jesus with flesh on, little Christians, us being that Jesus to you. Keep turning up. Should we worship Jesus? Should we get back together? <laughs> Can you stand with me? Let's just stand up for a moment.